Newsweek headline from November 2022. Shocking number of Americans believe we are living in the end times. 39% of U.S. citizens believe we are living in the end times. 47% of Christians believe we are living in the end times. What is shocking is that only 47% of Christians believe we are living in the end times. For one thing, the end times, also called the last days, began with the first coming of Jesus. The book of Hebrews in the Bible begins by saying, God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his son. And so we're in the last days already. Uh, And so it it wasn't a trick question, but I've got some advice for you. If you ever need to take a poll or somebody comes up to you on the street with a uh, microphone, just ignore whatever they ask you and say something you're sure about. You don't want to be that person who thinks that Montana is another planet somewhere, you know. (laughs) I mean, they always have those questions to show how dumb you are. And stuff, and I bet they don't know very much about Jesus Christ. But uh, believer, the, we're in the last days, so that's essentially that's a dumb question. Do you believe we're in the last days? Well, we are. Now, the shock to me is because the majority of Christians are not prepared to give an answer about the coming of Jesus when over a third of Americans are frightened by and seeking answers to what's happening in the world today. And what is going to happen tomorrow? So you see this 39% that is, uh, you know, not believers. Uh, and they don't, they've got their own ideas of what the end times is, even though they think we're in them. The first hurdle to clear in getting a handle on the future are the vocabulary and the terminology. What if I told you that we are pre-tribulation, rapture, premillennial, futurist, dispensationalists? <laughs> That's right. And so we need to introduce a few key terms. Oh, man. That's like that old joke where they say, well, what do you believe? Well, I believe what my church believes. What does your church believe? Well, they believe what I believe. <laughs> well, what do you and your church believe? We believe the same thing. <laughs> the church is a good place to start. The Apostle Paul explained that the church and the church age in which we live was a mystery in the Bible. Now, in the Bible, a mystery is a truth that was not previously known that now is being made known. The church is the unique group of believers starting with the day of Pentecost after Jesus rose from the dead until the rapture that we'll talk about in a minute. There is no church in the Old Testament, only Israel and the Gentile nations. One of the characteristics that sets us apart from other entities and groups in the Bible, that is the church, is that we currently have the permanent indwelling of God, the Holy Spirit. Individually, if you're a Christian, the Holy Spirit resides in you. And corporately, the entire body of Christ, you know, from all time, but especially the local congregation of believers, is also the temple of the Holy Spirit. And so the church is a unique uh, grouping of people that are saved from the Bay of Pentecost until the Lord comes. And you've undoubtedly heard of the rapture of the church. And we like to refer to it as the resurrection and rapture of the church because it has those two components. It is the return of Jesus when he will catch away all of the believers of the church age. Those deceased will be resurrected from the dead into their glorified physical bodies. Those who are alive will be changed in a moment In the twinkling of an eye, the Bible says, immediately receiving glorified physical bodies. And so the resurrection and rapture of the church, uh, Paul talks about it at length in 1 Corinthians 15, also in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, uh, where he says, uh, you know, the the Lord will uh, appear with a shout, the voice of the archangel, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. And that's a reference to people who are deceased in the church age. Not all the dead from all time, but just... Christians in the church age from the day of Pentecost forward. And then we who are alive and remain will be changed and together will always be with the Lord. A significant feature of the last days is a seven-year period of time that Jesus described by saying, for then there will be great tribulation such as has not been since the beginning of the world until this time no nor ever shall be. Because of Jesus' description, it's commonly called the great tribulation. 
It has other names and descriptions in the Bible. I'm not sure if the Great Tribulation is a name so much as it is a description. Because the word there uh, is qualified by what Jesus says next, that it's, it's the great one. It's the one that's you know, like no other tribulation the world has ever been through. Uh, and, and so, But we call it the Great Tribulation. Uh, I like the name the prophet Jeremiah used. He called it the time of Jacob's trouble. Now, Jacob, one of the patriarchs of the nation of Israel, and that's a way of referring to the physical descendants of Abraham. Uh, And so the time Jeremiah hones in and says, this is specifically the time of Israel's trouble, of Jacob's trouble on the earth. Now, although the tribulation of those seven years affects everyone who is on the planet, It is especially designed to bring the nation of Israel to saving faith in Jesus Christ. And glory to God, the Bible says that at the end of the tribulation, all Israel is saved. Now, a lot of Jews die during the tribulation, but those who are alive and remain, they are all saved. And so God brings them through and saves them. Armageddon is a word that gets easily misunderstood and misused. The word only appears one time in the Bible. It describes the Valley of Megiddo, where all the armies of the earth will be gathered to battle in the closing days of the time of Jacob's trouble. It has nothing to do with the asteroid uh, that Bruce Willis destroyed some, some years ago, uh, which saved our planet. I think he deserves a lot of credit for that, but anyway. The second coming of Jesus is just that. There are many more references to Jesus coming a second time than there are to his coming the first time. And so we, uh, we understand, uh, even if you're not a Christian, you understand Jesus came the first time. Uh, he's a historical figure. Well, there's a lot more information about him coming again a second time in the Bible. Millennium, that's a Latin word meaning thousand years. The millennium or the millennial kingdom is the kingdom of God on earth that will last for 1,000 years after the second coming. Now, regarding the millennium, There are differences of opinion as to its relation to Jesus Christ's second coming. Premillennial is the belief that Jesus' second coming is before the kingdom. He comes and he establishes the kingdom and rules over it for a thousand years. Postmillennial is the belief that Jesus will return after believers have established the kingdom on earth. And so we are, as the church, to... um, make things better and better and better until they're good enough for Jesus to come back and then rule from that point on. And then there's amillennialism. That's a belief that the current church age is the millennial kingdom and Jesus is ruling but not on earth in heaven and it's a figurative, not literal 1,000 years. If this is the kingdom, we're in trouble, uh, right? I mean, this is, it's not, not very nice out there. And then this gets parsed even further when we factor in the resurrection and rapture of the church in relation to the time of Jacob's trouble. If you believe the church will be resurrected and raptured before the time of Jacob's trouble, you are pre-tribulation. Others believe the resurrection and rapture happen one halfway through that time. That's a mid-tribulation position. Others believe the resurrection and rapture happen after the time of Jacob's trouble at the second coming. That's post-tribulation. And then there's preterism, the belief that all prophecy in the Bible is already history, that the interpretation of Scripture regards the book of Revelation as symbolic picture of first century persecution, not a description of what will occur in the last days. And so if you followed me through that, now you know why we are pre-tribulation, rapture, premillennial, future dispensationists. So that's, that's the position that we see in the Bible that makes the most sense. We're not saying these other positions are heresies or false teachings, uh, but uh, some of them, um, think, you know, the church has changed its view through history, depending on what's happening in politics and all. Uh, but our, our position is a solid one and makes the most sense and is biblically uh, justifiable. And so a futurist, what's a futurist? Well, that's somebody who understands that unfulfilled prophecies, including those about the coming tribulation in chapters 6 through 18 in the Revelation, will actually and accurately be fulfilled. And so we read the Bible just like the Old Testament saints read the Bible. Daniel was reading the, uh, you know, the book of Jeremiah, and he saw in there that God had specified that uh, their captivity would last for 70 years. And Daniel realized that they were right at that 70-year point, 
And so he started to pray and act accordingly with that. And so he believed that that was a real number, a real number of years, and that it could be counted on. He didn't see it as symbolic of anything. And so, um, uh, you know, we, we think there's a lot of prophecies, four or five hundred, I think, that haven't been fulfilled. And they will be fulfilled just the way God has always fulfilled prophecy. The most important feature of what is called dispensationalism is that we keep Israel separate from the church. They are two different entities, two different groups in the Bible. Uh, Some of you, if you do extra reading outside the Bible and studying, uh, a lot of the books that are written are written by conservative, reformed scholars, and they will talk about the church in the wilderness or the church in the Old Testament. And they just, they mean believers, but of course, uh, you know, the church isn't in the Old Testament. It's a mystery that Paul the Apostle reveals in the New Testament. Israel, Gentile nations. And what they do is they confuse the church with Israel. Uh, and um, it's sometimes called replacement theology. But uh, anyway, so what sets us apart is that we keep Israel distinct from the church and God's program for both. The ushers are going to pass out the pop quiz now. <laughs> and you only need a 75. You don't need a passing grade to get into heaven. So anyway... This is actually important exposure because a majority of believers don't realize that we're in the last days when the Bible says we are. And it's an important exposure because a lot of non-believers think these are the last days, but their knowledge comes from the movies, right? Uh, And and so, you know, another word we could have thrown in there was apocalypse, right? Uh, What is the apocalypse? Well, there's the zombie apocalypse, of course, right, which we're all worried about. I, I mean, that could happen. They could be outside the doors right now and stuff. <laughs> the door starts rattling. <laughs> and you better hope. Now, you better hope they're the slow-moving zombies and not the fast-moving. You, you, want, you want, you know, uh, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> so that's the idea of, Armaged- uh, of apocalypse. The word apocalypse means the unveiling or the revealing. It's the apocalypse of Jesus Christ, meaning that he is revealed in his glory and power coming back not to destroy the earth, but to save the earth. And so we, out in public, people who are not believers, they use the words completely wrong. Uh, Armageddon, apocalypse are the worst. And so we need to be able to uh, set them straight, uh, not, not for the purpose of being right, but so that they'll understand the times that we're in. And so, we're, you know, we've got a leg up on it. People are thinking, hey, yeah, this must be the last days because of everything I see. But then they don't know what that even means. And the last days to them means the end of the world. Uh, it means all of these dystopian movies where you've got, you know, several coats on and you're dragging your cart behind you and you're killing everybody along the way because there's some terrible virus or something like that. And they don't understand that Jesus is going to, if he has to, cut short those days and rescue the world at, his second, at the second coming. Now, let's get a little bit chronological. The resurrection and rapture of the church can occur any moment. They will occur before the time of Jacob's trouble. The time of Jacob's trouble does not involve the church. The angel Gabriel told the prophet Daniel that the seven years of the tribulation, he said, were for your people and for your holy city. That is the Jews and Jerusalem. Again, there will be Gentiles on the earth during that time, but the tribulation itself is God's intention to save his people. It's for Jerusalem. It's for Israel. There are numerous passages that definitely teach that the final seven years are a time of God dealing with the nation of Israel. There is no passage in which the church is described as participating in the time of Jacob's trouble. Some people will try and say, well, the, the, he doesn't use the word church, but, but there are believers there. Uh, yeah, but it's not the church. Jesus talked to his disciples on the Mount of Olives about the time of Jacob's trouble. At one point, he said, well, if you read through there, it's Matthew 24, a very important passage. If you read through there, Jesus lists all these uh, articles and items and geograph- uh, geographical locations that are specific to Israel. Uh, you get the idea that he's talking to Israel, but people say, well, he, you know, it starts in Israel, but then it spreads. But then he says something really interesting. He says, pray that your flight from persecution be not on the Sabbath. Now, why mention that? Be- the Sabbath is a strictly Jewish rite. It was never intended for the church. 
You can prove this from the Old Testament. Many times when the Sabbath is mentioned, it says it's a covenant between Jehovah and Israel. And so our Sabbath is a rest, a spiritual rest. And so when Jesus says, I hope you don't have to flee on the Sabbath because you're not supposed to go very far on the Sabbath. You can only go a few feet, you know, in every direction because you're supposed to be resting. And so Jesus intended that talk to be for Israel, not for the church. Jesus promised the church in Philadelphia in the book of the Revelation, because you have kept my commands and persevere, I also will keep you from the hour of trial, which will come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. They will definitely not be on earth during the time of trouble that exceeds all trouble. They will be kept from it, not kept safe in or through it. It can't be a promise just for that church, right? Because then there'd have to be a partial rapture. You know, Jesus takes them off the earth but leaves the rest of the churches on earth. That doesn't make any sense. Especially when you factor in other verses that promise the entire church will be kept from the wrath of God. Of course the church endures persecution and tribulation, right? Uh, Many, uh, probably most Christians in most parts of the world are are being persecuted right now uh, while we are not. And and I'm sorry, that's not my fault. Is that your fault? You know, did did God say, hey, I've got some persecution to pass around. Who wants it? We say, hey, give it to the Chinese. We're, you know, we, or how about there's some people in India who probably deserve. No, I mean, you know, I can't help it that we're not under persecution. It, it probably come and it'll get here sooner or later if, if we are here long enough before the rapture. And so, but persecution and tribulation isn't the great tribulation. It isn't the time of Jacob's trouble. It isn't where I don't see water turning to blood. I don't see wormwood falling out of heaven. Uh, you know, the grass isn't all burned up. There aren't earthquakes all over the earth. Mountains aren't being leveled. When that starts to happen, you're in the tribulation, okay? And, and so, uh, you know, we're not going to be in it. Now, there are those who say the church must be purified by going through the great tribulation. And you think, well, okay, because, um, you know, persecution, trials, they, they fire, you know, they fire you and, and you know, bring forth gold and all that. But then you remember Jesus said how he was going to sanctify the church. He said, I'm going to do it by the washing of the water of the word of God. He didn't say, you know how I'm going to get you to really be spiritual? I'm going to throw you into the great tribulation where you can suffer like people have never suffered before. No, he said, I'm going to wash you by the word of God and present you as my bride, faultless and without blemish before my father in heaven. One more thing, those of us who are pre-tribulation like to point out that in the book of the Revelation, the church is prominent in the first three chapters, but then never in chapters 6 through 18, which describe in detail the time of Jacob's trouble. Now, critics immediately dismiss that. They say, well, that's an argument from silence. Well, it's not an argument at all. It's an observation of facts. It's an observation. It's not an argument. The revelation of Jesus Christ mentions many unique players, uh, lots of of individual groups. There's 144,000 sealed Jews. There are four horsemen of the apocalypse, two witnesses, 24 elders, four living creatures, seven angels with seven trumpets. There is a group called the inhabitants of earth. There are three angels who give testimony. It goes on and on and on. There are very specific groups of angels and human beings. The omission of the church in the tribulation chapters really is significant. It may not prove anything by itself, but it makes perfect sense with the pre-tribulation rapture of the church. You wouldn't expect to find the church in those chapters because we've been raptured. Now think with me for a moment about the resurrection and the rapture of the church. It's going to create worldwide chaos and panic as multiplied millions of people disappear. When, uh, when I was a young Christian, uh, people used to say, oh, yeah, the, the rapture, uh, do you know that airlines make sure that one of the pilots or co-pilots is a non-believer? <laughs> because they're afraid that, and I, I, you know, as a young Christian, you believe anything, wow! <laughs> okay? And so, and you tell people, and then people say, you're an idiot, you know, come on. <laughs> However, now that we've established that you might have a pilot and a co-pilot that are both non-believers, you're going down, right? I mean, that plane's going down. 
How many planes? How many car crashes? How many train crashes? Well, they're doing pretty good on train crashes already. <laughs> Wait until engineers are gone. I mean, I mean, it happens faster than that. It's the twinkling of an eye. Uh, there's maybe, and this is probably a low estimate, there's somewhere near 60 million Christians in China. And, and so they're just going to be gone. The United States... For all we think we're failing and the church is weak and all of this, there are a lot of Christians in the United States and in places of government. Uh, I mean, it surprises us to think, well, the guy says he's a Christian and, and stuff. But if the rapture took place or when the rapture takes place in resurrection, um, our country would be pretty well decimated in terms of uh, leadership and what's going on. And we'll for sure need to become part of a North American union with Mexico and Canada and, and ripe for all the other stuff that's going to happen. And so, um, you know, so the, the writer of the Revelation, John, who got it by inspiration from the Spirit, uh, careful to name different groups at different specific times and what their roles were. And the church is just not in the tribulation. Think with me about the uh, uh, rapture of the church. You start thinking about this panic and the fact that global government and a cashless system of commerce and every person having some sort of personal identifier in order to participate in that system uh, could happen really easily. We could spend all day finding article after article showing we are already trending towards these things. Globalism is no longer considered a conspiracy theory. Just a few years ago, if you said, oh, the world leaders you know, are trying to do this, that, and the other thing, they'd say, oh, you're just some crazy conspiracy nut. But now they've come out and said, yeah, we want to have a new world order, a great reset. We want to build back better. And what they mean is that we want nations to surrender their sovereignty and have a somewhat like a United Nations situation. But that didn't really work. So it's going to have to be something a little bit more solid, a group of people who actually run the world, a totalitarian totalitarian government that circles the globe. And so... um, Believe it or not, a lot of countries are into that. Uh, And more and more our country, our leadership is getting into that, surrendering our sovereignty. The COVID epidemic has prepared the citizens of Earth to submit to just about every whim of government for the common good of humanity. And I'm not talking about what you believe about the pandemic. We're not going to argue, you know, this side believes it was real and this side doesn't. This side wears masks and that side doesn't. I, I don't care about any of that. What I'm saying is that uh, do you remember the mandates? Well, there's still some mandates, but do you remember? Uh, I mean, it, hey, today you're going to do this. Well, who are you to tell me that? What happened to due process? Where's freedom of speech? What was all, this is too important. And so we're going to have to violate your rights in order to make this happen. And uh, government overreach. This isn't the worst thing that happened unless you're an animal lover. But I just found out about this the other day over in... Uh, Denmark, I think it's in the Netherlands or Denmark, one of those places. Uh, I think it's pretty sure it's Denmark. They figured out that mink, the little animal, the mink, right, from where you get your mink coats, uh, <laughs> the mink could carry COVID. They could catch COVID and carry COVID, and they were concerned that it would become a huge health problem. It never did, but they were concerned it would. And so acting unilaterally, because there's a big mink industry in uh, Denmark, the government, the article said they culled the uh, population of mink. They killed all the mink, 17 million of them. Just, hey, we have to kill all the mink in our country, 17 million of them right now, because we might get AIDS, or not AIDS, but we might get COVID. (laughs) Maybe AIDS too, who knows, but I don't mean that. I shouldn't joke about that, but... You laughed. You laughed. And then it, and it drew me in, and then it stumbled me. So if you've been, ha- you've been hankering for a mink coat from the Netherlands, it's not coming. Uh, climate change mandates are giving governments greater power every day. Again, I'm not commenting on pro or con. You know, it was the warmest Easter I can remember. Whatever your opinion on climate change, it is radically affecting how people think uh, and in terms of what they're willing to sacrifice and all. And, and um, our, nation, our, our world is really changing. For the first time ever, really, 
We have the technology to eliminate cash and establish a truly global economy. And this is exactly what the Bible predicted would happen more than 2,000 years ago. Uh, and, and really, this is the first time in history it's been possible, and, and certainly in our generation, but really just within the last 15 or so years. And there are any number of personal biometric identifiers that could become the way we conduct our business. Once the entire planet is on that system, it's going to be easy for the beast, who we commonly call the Antichrist, to demand worship, threaten to cut a person off from all goods and services, hunt them down and kill them. You know, in the old Roman Empire, they had to give a pinch of incense to Caesar uh, once a year, I think it was, and say, Caesar is God. And most people had no problem with it because they were godless uh, Romans and and all, and they worshipped several gods, and it didn't matter if there was one more, maybe Caesar was a god, who cared? But it was a problem for Christians to say that Caesar is God and to, in, in a sense, worship him. And so they obviously began losing their jobs and their citizenship and their rights and their possessions and finally their life. Well, imagine halfway through the time of Jacob's trouble, the Bible says the man who, the beast, the Antichrist, he's going to say, guess what, guys? I should have told you this a few years ago. I'm God, and you're going to worship me. Well, what's going to happen if you're a Christian or an Israelite? You're not going to do that, right? But now you've got, you're connected to a system of commerce, and you've got a personal identifier. And the Antichrist and his people, they know where you are. They know what you're doing. uh, They know how to find you, and they know how to send Terminators out to destroy you. Uh, Hey, they already have drones and robot dogs and robot paratroopers and all. I mean so you know the, all these sci-fi things are going to come true but, and and it's it's weird and this we're the generation it's you know we could do that some people you know preppers if you're a prepper of course if you're a prepper you wouldn't be here this morning but um if you're a prepper you can you know you prep all you want they're going to find you and they're going to kill you uh if you uh, don't swear allegiance to caesar Fast forward to the end of the time of Jacob's trouble. The armies of the world are gathered together at Armageddon. That's the Valley of Megiddo. Suddenly the heavens break open. Jesus Christ appears riding a magnificent white horse in all of his glory and power. Earth's armies turn upon him. He destroys them easily with the breath of his mouth. The church comes with him. We aid him in the rule of the kingdom of God on earth, the millennium. Now, we began with a headline. Here's yesterday's headline. Muslim world must unite against Israel, Erdogan says to Iran's Rasi. Uh, Erdogan is Turkey's prime minister, and he's quoted as saying, whoever is on Israel's side, we're against them. And, and so they're trying to, ra- again, once again, they're trying to rally the Muslim nations to all come against Israel. When Israel became a sovereign nation in her homeland in 1948, it was a miracle and the fulfillment of prophecy. Israel is fulfilling many other prophecies, including this one in the book of Zechariah. Behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of drunkenness to all the surrounding peoples when they lay siege against Judah and Jerusalem. And it shall happen in that day that I will make Jerusalem a very heavy stone for all peoples. All who would heave it away will surely be cut in pieces, though all the nations of the earth are gathered against it. And so as we see the nations of the earth gathering against Israel, this too, uh, fulfillment of prophecy. We see that the nation of Israel, the city of Jerusalem, is a problem for the whole world. Can you imagine that? That would be like, I mean, I, I can't, this is a terrible illustration, but that would be like saying everybody in the world hates the people of Riverdale. <laughs> and uh, Hanford has, Hanford reaches out to Lamore. We need to unite against Riverdale. What did Riverdale ever do to you? (laughs) Right? And just this this hideous hatred and bitterness towards Riverdale. And you think, (laughs) as long as you keep laughing, I'll keep mentioning it. But anyway, (laughs) so, but that's the thing. What what has Jerusalem ever done to anybody? Right? And and this hatred, and it's, it's spiritual, it's supernatural, it's demonic, it's satanic. Uh, and it's the fulfillment of prophecy, and that's what's happening in these days. We live in this. This is the last days. Now, the facts don't tell the whole story. At every step, in every dispensation, 
The Lord is seeking to save lost sinners. Don't ever lose sight of that. The nature of God and his pattern of reaching out to save are established immediately in the Bible. From the very beginning, God communicates to his creation. He is not willing that any should perish. Adam and Eve sinned. God said, you've got the whole world and every kind of exotic fruit that you want to eat. Don't eat this. I think that's what we want. It's it's an easy one, but they, they didn't pass the test. And so sin came into God's perfect, beautiful creation. And you remember what happened, Adam and Eve, their eyes were open to the fact that they now had a sin nature. It wasn't just that they were naked, that some people believe that there was a radiance or a glow to them before they sinned, similar to what you see. And Jake was talking about this morning at sunrise, if you were spiritual and were there. And... Uh, <laughs> But um, anyway, they knew they were naked, and what they, they hid from God. Can you imagine that? I, who knows how much fellowship they shared, you know, whether it was years or decades or millennia or whatever. And, and then one day, God, God, God came in the garden every day to hang out with them. That's kind of cool. And, and then he, one day, they were hidden from him. They hid. And what did he do? He sought them out. He sought them out. And he essentially forgave them without them ever really confessing. Because Adam blamed Eve and Eve blamed the devil. But he did something more. He said, guys, I've got a, I've got a way out of this. It's the seed of the woman. And as the Bible progresses, you see that the seed of the woman means that God would come himself in human flesh, born of a woman, born of the virgin, in order to take our place for the penalty of sin, which was death. And so theologians even call that The Proto-Evangelicum, I think it is, the first evangelism, the first gospel. And so right there before you even get out of the Garden of Eden, God establishes that I seek after sinners. I love them, I draw them, I want them, I am not willing that any should perish, not on my end. A little while later in the Bible, we read that God came down to earth when human beings were rebelling against him. They were building a tower to worship other gods. The Lord scattered them all over the earth, confusing their language. And then we read this in the book of Acts. And and think about that episode of Babel. God says, I'm going to scatter you all over the earth, confuse your language. And then in the book of Acts, the apostle Paul says this. He has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on the face of the earth. He has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings so that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. And so Paul looked back, the Apostle Paul looked back on the Bible, and he said this incident, really, you know, where God scattered everybody, that was for their good, so that they would seek the Lord and find him because he's not far. And you and I look at that and think, well, wait a minute, how, how, does, that, how does that work? I mean, some people see it as criticism. If you're sharing Christ with them, they say, well, what about the pygmy in Africa? What, about, what they mean is, what about the person who's never heard? I'm pretty sure pygmies know about God by now because I'm sure everybody's gone to them and say, hey, are you a pygmy? You need to hear about God so that I can put this argument to bed. Um, but anyway, I wonder, are pygmies still called pygmies? Well, you know, little people, we don't call people dwarfs anymore, do we? Or No, so I mean, I don't know what's woke now with pygmies. But uh, look it up. Uh, Anyway, why do I do those things? God says, I did this so that they could get saved. Following the scattering, the Lord determined to create a new nation, the nation of Israel, through Abraham. One of the purposes of Israel was to be a light to the Gentile nations, meaning to show them the beauty and the holiness of the God whom they worshipped. The church age is a time for Christians to go, therefore, making disciples of all men, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all the things that Jesus has commanded. So obviously we we understand our time is a time of real evangelism. For all of its horror, the time of Jacob's trouble features the greatest evangelistic effort in the history of the world. We're introduced to a unique group of Jews. I mentioned them earlier. 144,000 strong, 
12,000 from each of the 12 tribes of Israel. They are sealed by God in such a way that they cannot be harmed. Immediately after we meet them in the book of the Revelation, we see multitudes of people who have been saved uh, ostensibly through their testimony. We're introduced to two men whom we call the two witnesses. They go about sharing the gospel. They're not only indestructible, but certain times they defend themselves by calling fire down out of heaven. They're eventually martyred, but three and a half days afterwards, the entire world watches live on CNN as they rise from the dead and ascend into heaven. By the way, this, um, this idea of, of people, the whole world being able to see that, what a laughable idea that was until how many years ago? You know, the first live broadcast didn't, um, wasn't that long ago. Uh, I think it was in my lifetime. It was an ABC Wide World of Sports thing. I mean, now we see things all over the world. We get annoyed now because of that delay. Do you, do you know that delay? And now we go to uh, uh, Lance with, uh, you know, he's in the hurricane. Lance, what do you see? <laughs> Hi, this is Lance. Uh, in this modern age, we can't sync up, I guess. But, you know, I mean, that's fairly, you know, we're annoyed, but it's fairly recent. And, and so the Bible said, hey, I'm going to tell you, these two guys are going to lay in state in Jerusalem. People are going to have a party because they're dead. And the entire world is going to watch them rise from the dead. That's a, what a ridiculous thing to say. And yet it's true. The prophet Isaiah declares... In the future millennium, the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. And so in every age that we've talked about this morning, the Lord is saying, hey, I'm doing this to save people. I'm doing this to reach out. I'm seeking after sinners. From beginning to end, God is seeking and saving. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. God is not willing that any should perish, but that all would come to repentance. No one can come to Jesus unless God draws them. Jesus said that by being lifted up on the cross, dying as our substitute, he would, in fact, draw all men to himself. He is thus the Savior of all men, especially those who believe. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart, that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. By grace, you are saved through faith. It's a gift from God, not from works, lest you would boast. We are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we would walk in them. He who began a good work in us will complete it until the day of Christ Jesus. We are looking for the blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet of God. The dead will rise first, then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. If you are here today and you are not a believer in Jesus, it is absolutely 100% because Jesus is seeking you to save you. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. If you're a Christian, the Lord has found you. But you could, each of us could have a testimony of his seeking. We didn't maybe understand it at the time, but looking back on it, God was seeking us, hunting us down, as it were, so that he could reveal his beauty and his grace to us. And there came that time in your life when You made a decision for the Lord. He freed your will so that you could decide for him and become a Christian. Your sins were forgiven. You realized that he was your substitute on the cross. You know you're standing before God in the filthiest clothes uh, imaginable. Jesus says, I took those and I'm giving you a robe of righteousness so that you can go to heaven. And rejoice in the Lord. You have problems. You have tribulation. You're not in the great tribulation. You're not going to be in the great tribulation, but you have trouble. And trouble does bring forth, uh, you know, good things in your life, spiritually speaking. But whatever trouble you're in, the Lord knows about it. He's, he's, you know, afflicted with your infirmities and familiar with them. And so just trust him. Run to him. Uh, redouble your efforts to know him. 
and, and be with him. And you, if you're not a believer, uh, this, we live in a very volatile world. And I, I guess it's silly to say this, but we're in the last of the last days. You know, there's that doomsday clock that some scientists have because of nuclear war. It's always like 11.59 and 58 seconds or something like that. Oh. And I'm watching television the other day, and uh, President Trump says, we're headed to nuclear war. And I thought, oh, okay. Wow. I got my old school desk out and got underneath it. <laughs> I'm no dummy. I mean, if we're close to nuclear war, then, uh, you know, let's do it. But, um, hey. The world is a volatile place, but behind it, you know, are the things we're talking about. You know, if you're not a believer, you look at the world and say, what is going on? People are not rational. They don't make sense. You can't argue with them. The world is going to hell in a handbasket, as people like to say. We're going down the drain. We're going down the tubes. What's going on is spiritual. It's this stuff that we're talking about. It's the world eventually moving towards the great tribulation, the time of Jacob's trouble, so that God can finish this thing out, save who's going to be saved, and, and get on into eternity. And so if you're here this morning, if you're here today and you're not a Christian, we invite you to meet Christ, to come to know Jesus Christ as your Savior. There's no hope for you anywhere else. I'll just tell one more brief thing. I tried to fit this into the, uh, the study. I knew it wouldn't fit, but I'm going to tell you about it anyway. <laughs> anyway, and I can't even pronounce it. What is it? I'm going to make something up. It's like Shobu Kanas. Anyway, there's certain, there's some monks in Japan. They don't do this anymore. Some monks in Japan, and there's a name for them. And what they do is they go through a, a process of literally embalming themselves over a period of time. It's the craziest thing. And so they have this crazy diet they go on for three years. And then some of them repeat that. And then after that diet, if, they, if they're still alive, I mean, they're drinking lacquer and stuff, like, you know, from this certain tree so that it, it will preserve you from the inside. If they live through that, they get put in a box, and, which is a coffin, essentially, and, and down into the earth a little bit, and they ring a bell if they are still alive. And, and so the other monks who are not as spiritual are listening for this bell. And when they don't hear the bell anymore, they, they bury him alive. Well, he's dead. They bury him where he is. And then after three more years, they pull up the casket. And if he's mummified, they revere him and he's spiritual. And there's some of these guys are on display that you can worship. One, I wish I had a picture of him. He had sunglasses on. It was the greatest thing. But he's this old shriveled up monk with sunglasses on. And some of them don't make it. Some of them, and they just, well, we're going to bury this guy. He didn't make it. That's religion. If you can do that. The world says you deserve to go to heaven. But you're not going to make it heaven. You don't want that shriveled up body, <laughs> right? Jesus rose from the dead in a glorified physical body. That's what he has for you. And, and you don't have to do anything except believe him. And so that's the comparison. You know, it, you want to be a Buddhist? That's, that's their idea of real spirituality. You're not going to do that. And so why fool with that? Come to Christ. Come to Jesus. His yoke is easy. His burden is light. Guys are going to be down here this morning for anybody who wants prayer. Um, come on down, especially if you're not a believer. We want to pray with you and pray for you. But if you're a believer and there's some things going on in your life, maybe you're backslidden, maybe you're struggling this morning with sin in your life, habitual sin, whatever it is, take advantage of this time of prayer. You believe prayer changes things, right? That it's important that the righteous prayer, the prayers of the righteous affect much. So... Come and get prayed for.